Which one? The one who Deborah. Deborah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up. It's a great story. There were some incredible women in the Bible. I mean, even in the New Testament, when you see uh, the stories of God, uh, of women who are caught in the act of adultery or had demons cast out of them or women like in the book of Acts and there was, uh, wow, what was that name? The, 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 the woman who was married to the dude who had a name that sounded just like his. No, no, they weren't. That's not the kind of women you want to be like. Priscilla and Aquila. Give that woman a gold star. Priscilla and Aquila. I mean, this woman just was strong in the Lord and, you know, constantly bringing people to her husband to minister. I had such great plans. However, the Lord had me to do something else, and I believe it was probably for some or more than one person that's here tonight. So continuing on past these fine young women who were strong. Uh, let me read you their names again because I'm going to be disobedient for a second, just for a moment. And their names of his daughters were Mahalal, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Terza. These women who, in a time women were treated more of as possessions, were in a time where if you had three daughters and one son, you'd say, this is my son. In a time where women were thought to be less, not a blessing. Here comes these women, and they go straight to the horse's mouth, as it were. They go to Noah, and they say, listen, we don't have any brothers. And you know what? They probably said, we don't even need any brothers. Our father died in the desert, and he didn't die with the whole rebellion. He just died. He was a sinful man. He died. But we don't have a possession. You've given possessions to all of the people of Israel. We don't have a land to dwell in. And we don't think it's fair that our father's name should die because God set forth that when we marry, we don't get to keep our own name. We don't think that's fair. Guts. Brave. These women had it. Some women are. You know, the Bible says what? Chutzpah. Chutzpah. I forgot what I was just going to say, honey. What does that mean? Huh? What does that mean? Chutzpah? Sure. Gravitas. Spunk. Spunk. Oh, did you say that in church? He said cojones in church. <laughs> yes, they did. They had, they, had, they had the idea that God cared more about the minister than the ministry. I love that about these women. They were not afraid. They were bold. And I love also this. Look at verse 4 again. Why should the name of our father be done away with from among his family? Because he hath no son? Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father. And I want you to see verse 5. It's a key verse for our study today. And Moses brought their cause before the Lord. Please give me your attention. Understand this. Every dynamic of every situation is not enumerated in the Bible. <gasps> now, I believe the Bible has all you need to live life, all you need to raise kids, all you need to work hard. Everything that you have that you encounter in your life is in the Bible, but every dynamic is not. And you'll understand what I mean in a minute. But listen, Moses, in the humility and strength and power of the Holy Ghost, he stands there and these women come before him. Could you imagine? Could you imagine these women come before him? Here he is, this, the leader of three million plus people, about to go into the promised land. And these ladies, they come before him. Well, hey, we got a complaint. The Bible doesn't say everything about. Some woman comes to me and says, hey, the Bible doesn't say anything about my situation. I go, ugh. First thing is, you're such a fool, you don't know. And they bring their cause before Moses, and you know what he goes? You're right. It doesn't. The Bible does not specifically enumerate up till this point in time, and they had the oral word of God, what to do. What do we do? 
Moses did what every good man or woman of God should do, brought it before the Lord. Let me read you a couple of verses from the Old Testament. Proverbs 3.32 says that the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. His secret counsel. There is secret counsel. God wants to impart to you secret counsel. In Psalm 25, 14, and I wrote these verses down because I didn't memorize them. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. There are some situations where you got to go, I'm not sure, let me bring that to the Lord. Isaiah 45, 3, you know, turn there. Keeping your place in numbers, please. To the right, a bunch of pages to the book of Isaiah. You'll get to Jeremiah. It's right before Jeremiah. Isaiah 43, I'm sorry, 45, starting in verse 3. 45, starting in verse 3. Listen to this. Receive this. And I will give, say everybody amen when you're there. Help the brother get there. Yeah, read it. Just read it with him. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places and thou mayest, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by name, am the God of Israel. Great verse. Listen to me, please. Turn back to Numbers. Many people, they come to me for counsel. If I was going to be humble, yet telling you one of the things that I believe God has gifted me in, I believe one of them is counsel. I believe God gives me verses in my heart and in my mind that I never thought I knew. They were bouncing around in there. I believe that God will give me a word of wisdom for my brethren, for my sisters, for the married couples. I love counseling. I would stay here day and night and talk to people because it's like a task that you set before me. And I go, okay, how do we handle this? What does the scripture say? And sometimes I'll even go, let's pray about it. Give me a day. Give me a moment. Give me a few days. Let me think on this. There's got to be something. I want you please to understand that many people take scriptures that are talking about counsel and secret wisdom the wrong way. Because God will never, you ready? This is a write down, this is a memory, this is a, a statement you must remember. One of the things I learned early on when I first started hearing the voice of the Lord in my spirit and relaying it through my mouth. God will never give you a revelation that contradicts his word. God will never give you a revelation that contradicts his word. God will never give you a revelation that contradicts his word. So when somebody tells you, God told me to marry this person, even though they're not a believer. God told me to go into business with that person, even though they're not a believer. Anytime God says, a person says, God said this, and you go, dude, that is not scriptural. You know that person is not receiving secret counsel. They're receiving personal counsel. That's called self-counsel. And there are many people that do this. And you could write this down for homework. Proverbs 18.1 says that a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire and rages against all sound judgment. When you meet with somebody and they want the biblical counsel or the secret wisdom and you find out First is, they don't go to your church. And you go, what church you go to? Well, I go to the harbor, or I go to church by the glazer. Why are you coming here? Well, I didn't like what they said to me there. That's the, that's the um, interpretation of what happens. The interpretation is, I don't like what they told me there, so I want somebody to tell me what I want. What they do is, well, 
The Bible says in much counsel is wisdom. That you should get, before you wage war, you should get many counsels. Don't do that if the Bible's really clear. Don't go into business with somebody that's a non-believer. Now, some people say, I'm thinking about going and starting a church. We need secret counsel for that. We need secret wisdom. We need to sit and talk. We need to have you sit here and discuss. We need to see how you receive God's word before you can give God's word. Absolutely. How could somebody say in scripture, no, don't go start a church. What do you mean don't go start a church? Go make disciples of all nations. Of course you want, yes, we want you to go start a church, but that might not be your calling. And let me tell you something, taking a yoke upon you that is not the calling of God will lead you to frustration and defeat and shame. Continuing, back to Numbers 27. Verse 5 again, And Moses brought their cause before the Lord, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelephahed speak right. Thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren, and thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them, and thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. And if, ye have, and if he have no daughter, then ye shall give his inheritance unto his brethren. And if he have no brethren, then ye shall give his inheritance unto his father's brethren. And if his father have no brethren, then ye shall give his inheritance unto his kinsmen. That is next of him and his family, and he shall possess it, and it shall be unto the children of Israel a statute of judgment, as the Lord commanded Moses. Give me your attention, please. Wow, Moses found something out. These girls were right. And Moses found out that God wants to give him secret wisdom. Leaving your place in Numbers, turn to two books to the right, I'm sorry, one book to the right. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy, the fifth book of Moses, 28 and 28. Why am I not finding it? No, something I did wrong. Stay right there, don't move. Make sure here, I don't want to mess this up. 29, ding dong, 29 and 29, next, just the next page over, look at 29 and 29, the very next book of the Bible, Moses, also writing, says, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, and unto us, and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Moses, recalling his experience just a few years earlier, said the secret things of our God belong unto the Lord our God, but these things also belong to his children. There are secret things that he wants to reveal to his children. You have situations going on in your life. You Leave there. Turn to 1 John. All the way at the end of the Bible, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, the first epistle of John. 1 John chapter 2, look at verse 24. Everybody's there? Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Verse 25, now the key. So abide in this, and this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you, 
concerning them that seduce you, them that trick you, them that beguile you, them that wish you harm, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the name, as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now, I know there's a lot there to absorb. Let me explain that to you. Listen, there's something very important that God is saying here, and there's something very important that he's not saying here. Here's what he's saying. Chuck Smith put it this way, and I love it, before I even get to that. When a counterfeit, you know they have these people in the government that are hired to see counterfeit bills. And you know how they study to detect counterfeit bills? By studying the real deal. You, they look at a $100 bill, they look at a 50 they look at a 20 they look at it day and night, they look at every nuance and every line, they look at the watermarks and everything. You know what they don't look at? The counterfeits. If you will study the real deal, you'll know the counterfeit when it comes along. And this is exactly what John was talking about. If the truth abides in you, if the son's father abides in you, he will abide in you and he will teach you that you cannot be seduced from these things. But let me tell you what some people have done in this verse. They say... I don't need to go to church. I don't need to be taught by a pastor. I don't need to seek counsel because it says right here in 1 John, I don't need that anybody should teach me. That is not what this says. Please, if you've been lied to like this or have heard this in the past, the Bible will not contradict itself. Because some people say, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to hear from a pastor. I don't need to submit myself. The Bible says right here, Anointing which I have received, I don't need anybody to teach me anything. Well, why does then the Bible say, do not forsake the gathering of the brethren, as is the manner of some? Why does the Bible say they continue steadfastly? Why does the Bible say that a book of remembrance was written of those who gathered together in the name of the Lord? You cannot think you can walk this walk alone. Remember Proverbs 18.1, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all sound judgment. Now, I've given you the information. Now let me give you the road to this information. Turn from here and turn to Matthew chapter 6, please. Because it's one thing to tell you what it is. I could tell you how to prepare the meal. For instance, I make this incredible food. It's one of the best meals I make. My wife loves it. I make a pesto sauce Angel hair pasta. And what I do is first I take olive oil and butter and I cook it together and I melt it. And then I take pine nuts and put it in the pan and, and, and toast them. I toast them in there. Then I take sun-dried tomatoes and I slice it and then I fold that into it too. And I make a whole sauce out of it. And then what I do is I'll take some um, balsamic vinegar, I'll take some other seasonings, and I what's called reduce it. In case I boil it down till it's really, really thick. And then I take angel hair pasta. And I boil angel hair pasta, a little salt in the water, a little light on the oil, and I boil it down. And then I put it in a pan, and then I pour that sauce that I made over it, and then I put tons and tons of Pecorino Romano over it. It's a type of Romano cheese, very sharp. It's so good. Now, why did I just do that to you guys? To make you hungry? I'm hoping that what I just did was make you hungry for the things of God. You want secret wisdom? You want secret counsel? You want to do like I do? Have you guys ever been here when I prayed over somebody and later on you go, and you, you talk to that person and go, I don't know how he knew I, I don't know how he knew that about me. I don't know why he prayed that verse over me. That verse, was, I don't know why. I don't know how. You want that? I'm going to tell you how. Warren Wiersbe said this. And I love this. The secret to prayer is secret prayer. The secret to prayer is secret prayer. You want to be hungry for the things of God? The Word of God says, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What? For they shall be what? 
filled. God wants to see his people hungry. Now, generally, the people who come to me and they tell me what God told them for me, for instance, it's just a few years ago, a guy who was coming to our church for a few months wants to take me out to lunch. Bro, I've been waiting to get close to this dude for a while. He takes me out to lunch and we have a great lunch. We have a wonderful talk. He tells me about his family, tells me about... And at the time, I had said a couple of things from the pulpit that probably shouldn't have said. They involved a, a manner of speaking that's a little bit coarser than she was. his wife was used to. I said, gee, buddy, I'm sorry I did that. Please... Would you ask your wife to forgive me and tell her that I'm going to work hard not to do that stuff anymore. I just, I get wound up and I say things in, in, in what I think is passion and they, they come out in my flesh. And he goes, oh, I, I totally understand. Cool. Well, we're about to pay the bill and the dude looks at me and goes, oh, there's something else. I want to take you to a scripture. I go, okay. He takes me to scripture. And you guys know the story of Uzziah who put his hand on the cart when it, the oxen stumbled? Great story in the Bible. It's in Second uh, Samuel, I believe. I don't even remember exactly where it was. Where the Ark of the Covenant was being taken back into Israel. And they put it on a cart. Donkeys leading it. And you ever see donkeys walk? They kind of bounce when they walk. Well, they put this cart on there. You don't like the way I did that? I won't do that again. And as the donkeys were walking, the road must have been bumpy. They were, the cart almost fell. And Uzziah, huh, he reaches up and he makes sure that the thing doesn't fall. Lightning comes down, boom, hits him, dead right there. I said, that's an incredible story. Uh, I know that story well. He goes, that's what God's going to do to you. I said, squeeze me. Yet God told me to tell you he's pronouncing judgment on your, on your family. I said, wait a second. On who? On me? You and your family. I was like, forgive me, but do you have any Bible verse to back this up? Are, are you serious? Dude, are you sitting there telling me you are cursing me? Now, I threw verse after verse in him and why what he said was wrong. How he, uh, You asked me to confess a sin to you. I said I was sorry. I asked you for forgiveness, and now you're pronouncing a curse on me and my family? Needless to say, I was ill-impressed. I asked him if he was finished. I took him back to, my car, to his car, and I, I went, Bruh. I said, just know this, buddy. Um, if you're going to stay at our church, you're going to be brought before the elders, and you're going to be asked to explain your position scripturally, because I can't have you cursing the pastor and his family. Forget about the fact that it's me. There's an office here that you're not respecting. Don't respect me as a person. I, I understand that. But the office of a pastor, is in, it's a pretty big deal. It's a major calling in somebody's life. It leaves them open to all kinds of scrutiny from the people, from God himself. The angels of the Lord are looking down upon that person, ready to give him messages, the Bible even says. What you've just done is serious. Well, we sat down with the elders a couple of days after that. He not only did not repent, but confirmed him and his family left the church, and I wish them well, trying to forget about it. This man lacked knowledge of what Scripture really said. What he had was zeal. Zeal without knowledge is a very dangerous thing. Zeal without submission is murder. He broke so many scriptures in bringing me this word. Now, why did I tell you this story? Was it just to air dirty laundry? No. It's to let you know again and again and again, before I explain to you the secret prayer and the secret wisdom and the secret counsel God wants to impart to you, please know this. I forget who it was. I think it was John MacArthur. He said, The word without prayer makes you a legalist. Prayer without the word makes you weird. Very important to have the proper balance. For you will hear your own conscience, your own thoughts, your own desires, your own wills in prayer if you do not temper them with the Word of God. For instance, 
If anybody's ever seen a guy like Benny Hinn or some ultra Pentecostal guy on TV, and he goes and lays his hands on people and they fall down slain in the spirit. Has anybody ever seen that? It's really weird. Now, if I was to have a prayer meeting in this church, and in the prayer meeting, I was to have Alex stand up, and we were to put our prayer, and me and Dustin and Ryan and Papa, we prayed over him. Believe me when I tell you, he would experience a touch from the Holy Spirit. But his choice to fall down and do this whole thing would be his. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Scriptural versus non-scriptural. I'm not saying when Benny Hinn does these things that there is not something moving upon these people in the power of the Holy Spirit or the power of another spirit, especially knowing where Benny Hinn's coming from and his doctrinal beliefs. Anybody know who Benny Hinn is? That's not, yeah, he's not a, uh, that's not some born-again teacher of God's word. That is a wicked man, just so you all know. He is a false prophet, a false teacher, a false healer. Just please understand that. And if I've offended you in that, thank God. <laughs> the secret to prayer is secret prayer. The secret to prayer is secret prayer. God wants to impart in you wisdom, discernment, knowledge. God wants to tell you things. Listen, it was my pastor, Ken Graves, who said this to me. Ryan, God wants to show you something he hasn't shown anybody in 2,000 years. Don't you want to hear what he's got to say? When I first started teaching the Bible, I did what I was taught. I went out and I bought all these different commentaries on people who had taught the scriptures. I bought commentaries by Warren Wiersbe and Chuck Smith and John Corson and then Matthew Henry. And, and I wanted to get wise, so I bought all these preachers and I'd read them. I went from being a non-reader to a major reader. And I read them all, and I put them all together, and I put it in my head, and I'd come up and I'd teach the Bible. And this one said this, and this one said that, and sometimes I'd make it my own. And when I got to hanging out with Ken, he said, it's a nice uh, library you got. Why do you need it? Don't you just want to spend time with God? He said, if you spend as much time in prayer as you do reading these commentaries, I bet God will say something more important to you than they got to say. And just maybe he has something that nobody else ever said. And he told me a few things that the Lord showed him. Nothing earth shattering. Nothing that changes the course of history. Nothing that uh, changes doctrine. Just some interesting stuff. I remember he told the story. I remember when the story in the Bible where, where the Lord Jesus uh, fed the 5,000. And he said, why do you think he had them all sit down in groups? What did that create? And I fellowship. And I came up with all my answers. He goes, no, aisles. Aisles. Yeah. <laughs> you can't feed 5,000. He said, what do you think I came up with that? The Lord showed it to me. In prayer. I was like, man. And then he talks about one time he said during prayer, he was looking at the book of Acts. You guys know it when, when the guy Malchus gets his ear cut off by Peter? He said he thought about that. And he put himself in that position. And the Lord gave him this really cool vision. There he is. Peter goes to cut his, cut his head off. But he didn't cut his head off. He said he either ducked or and just cut his ear off. He said then the Lord picks his ear up and puts it back on his head. He said, I thought about that. And I prayed about that. And he said, how do you think that happened? Did they have to go, wait a second, look for this ear. It's dark. It's the night. And then he's got to go around picking it up, and there is that ear. Did he have a bunch of guys help him? And then he says he sticks his ear back on his head like he's Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> and I thought, I never read that anywhere before. Never heard that. It doesn't change, you know, it, it's not blasphemous. Where did you get that from? So Ryan, I just prayed it out, man. I just prayed it out. Pray it out. Wow, where'd you get that? I didn't make it up. I prayed it out. You understand? God wants to impart in you secret counsel. 
There are a lot of things the Bible doesn't say. I meet with people all the time and they tell me that their kids are, are hooked on some kind of internet pornography. Well, how do you get your kid off of that? You're going to see internet pornography in here? Another kid, another family comes to me. My daughter is um, hooked on... What's the new drug of choice now? It's at uh, Oxycontin. Can't find Oxycontin in here. You know what you can find in here? The dynamic of what it is. So now, with the secret counsel of the Lord, the Bible says that this man brought his son to the apostles, but they couldn't do anything. And what was the kid doing? He was throwing himself in the fire and in the water. Fire and water. Fire of the world, the water of the world, the poison of the world. So what did he do? He brought him right to Jesus. And he said, Lord, we brought him to your apostles, but they couldn't do anything. And you know what the Lord said to him? Does anybody remember? Anybody want to... What did he say, Dustin? I just read this this morning. Tell me. Hallelujah. This only comes out by prayer and fasting. Now, when a mother comes to me and says, what do I do? My daughter is hooked on Oxycontin. You bring it to the Lord. You start prayer and fasting. I didn't find that in the Bible. Oh, when a daughter, let me look up in the back. Oxycontin. Okay, here it is. No, but the dynamic is in here. And you need the secret wisdom, the secret counsel of the Lord to direct you. Boom. Ah. Turn off the internet. Oh, I, I, work, on the, I work online. I, I, listen, the Bible says if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. You don't really think you're going to stab the kid in the eye, right, and pop, pop his eye out. You really don't think Jesus Christ wanted you to cut your hand off because you can't stop your personal thing. No. What do you do? You cut off the source. You get serious. You get real. You worry more about your life than you do about your pleasures. You worry more about your spiritual well-being than you do your family business. Because what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? Now, where did that all come from? The secret counsel of the Lord in heavy, deep prayer. Not prayer in the shower. Not prayer on the way to work. Not prayer, you know, even with my wife and children. The secret counsel of the prayer, when you're sitting there and you're not going through the list of things that you want from God, when you are what? Let's read it from Matthew 6.6. 6. Matthew 6.6 6 says this. But thou, when thou prayest, when you, when you pray, enter into your closet. And I thought to myself, the first time I read that, I was like, huh, he had a closet too. I got a closet. Did they have closets back then? Or did we name closets after what he was talking? I thought that was interesting anyway. That's something to bring to prayer. Enter into your closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. There's that word again. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore likened unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore pray ye. And then he goes through the list of things which I then cut up into subsections in my life, which I do every single day. Every single morning I wake up and the first thing I do is let my dogs out because I got too many dogs and we all go outside and I start walking back and forth on the deck and I go, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father. Okay. Father, I love you. I praise you. I worship you. I love you. I thank you. And I try to think of as many ways to praise him. And then I go, our oh, Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be. Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom. God, I surrender to you. I surrender my relationship with my wife. I surrender this church to you. I surrender. And I go through all that list. The whole thing, every subsection means something different in what I bring to God. And I lose the pattern, but not 
the words. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Hail Mary. I said it five times. I'm free now, right? Anybody remember that? Remember those days? <laughs> and then after that's over, I go, okay, God, I've done way too much speaking. What do you want to reveal to me? I just want to be still and know that you're God. I want secret counsel. I want secret knowledge. I want secret wisdom. What do you want to speak to me? And the vast, vast majority of the time, there's nothing but the stillness of the wind, the dogs licking my foot or the pool or whatever it is. But every once in a while, I get past something in the heavenlies and God drops something right into my heart. And I go, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Couldn't be me because I'm not near that smart. And it's weird. And you guys know this. When God speaks, he's like, if I want to tell Dustin about the jiu-jitsu class, I say, oh, man, he went crazy today. I'm telling you, it was, more of a, it, was more of a, uh, it was more of a conditioning class. He had us do these passes. And, first we did this, and, and it would take me 20 minutes to tell him what we did in this hour class, right? God doesn't do that. God takes, like, something the size of a, a pea, and he just, boom, and he drops it in you, and all of a sudden, boom, the whole thing's there. Remember those sponges back in the old days? Yeah. They were, like, this big. When you add water, they go, Phew. My kids have them now. It's like a little pill. You put it in water, and the next day it's like a horse this big. It's like, that's cool. That's what it is. God takes that little sponge thing, and he drops it in you. You keep adding the water of the word and the water of prayer, and it just enlarges, 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 until you're full, and now you're ready. This is why I wake up at 5, 5.30 in the morning on Sunday. i got to be here by 9, 9.30. i got to be ready. Man, I ain't coming here after rolling out of bed, man. I want to... I want to be enlarged. It's going to, somebody's going to need some counsel. Somebody's going to need some wisdom, and God knows who it is. And when I'm getting up here, man, i got to have something to say. i got to pray it out. I don't know what I'm going to say half the time when I stand up here. I just know I've been reading it and praying it through all week. So I need some secret counsel, some secret wisdom. And you want to know the best thing about it? Close your Bible. This is where I finish. Here's the best thing about it. There's no calling in the Bible for people who pray. It didn't say... God's counsel. Let me read that verse to you again. Yeah, look at it says. His secret counsel is with the upright. It didn't say it's with the upright pastors. It's not with the, um, it says the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. See, it didn't say the secret of the Lord is with guys, not chicks. Sorry. It's with the upright. It's with those who fear him. And he says, I love verse 45 of, of Isaiah. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, am the God of all Israel. So tomorrow when you wake up, don't do your praying in the car on the way to work. Don't even do it in the shower, although it's a good place to pray. I'm not saying you don't pray in those times, but don't let that be your only place to pray. The Bible says to pray without ceasing. And when you receive some secret counsel, some secret wisdom from God, and you wonder if it's the Lord, especially you who are a part of this congregation. You come to me and say, Pastor, I think the Lord showed me something. Could we confirm it? Absolutely, let's do it. And you say, well, I'm dating this girl, and she doesn't know the Lord, but I think she's the one I'm to marry. I think God told me that. <laughs> no, that wasn't the Lord. <laughs> How do you know? Because the Bible... You got that, right? Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you so much for your word, the power of your word, the redemption of your word, the wisdom of your word. God, thank you that your word says there is no wisdom, counsel, or understanding against the Lord, that a horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. Bless us, God. And may, as everybody is hungry right now for a good pesto sauce with pine nuts, may they also be more hungry for the spirit of the living God who gives secret counsel to those that ask. God, bless us with your spirit. We stand on the promise of your word. We seek, we ask, we knock. Prepare our hearts to ask and knock and not just to seek. We want to find you in a time that you may be found, and we want to hear your voice above all other voices. There are many, many voices in our hearts and minds, God. Help us to know what your voice says. What does the Spirit say to this church 
Tell us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great night. We'll see you on Sunday, Lord willing. And ladies, please get here tomorrow.